But it's an ugly setting. Gamaliel, one of the members of the high council, calms the anger of the Sanhedrin, at least to a degree. He tells them that if, if this movement is of God, you're not going to be able to stop it. You're going to find yourself fighting against God. If this movement is of men, it'll run out of gas and it'll be gone before you know it. So just let them be. But here's what the Sanhedrin did. They, they beat them. Flogged them. They beat them mercilessly. They inflicted physical pain beyond what I've ever had to endure. And then they told them, don't talk about this Jesus anymore. No more Jesus stuff. We've heard enough. And they let them go. And this is where verse 41 simply grabs me. Catch that. They've been imprisoned overnight, miraculously set free, bought brat before the council, so angry they wanted to kill them. They're flogged, told not to talk, preach about Jesus, and now they're free. And we read, so they went on their way rejoicing. They had a song on their lips because their heart was filled with Jesus. Think about that for a minute. I'd have been going, man, I'm calling my congressman. I was mistreated. They shouldn't treat me like that. I was falsely imprisoned. I was falsely beaten. I was falsely, 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 all because of my beliefs. Now they're, they're, they're singing praises to Jesus. There's the, the book of Psalms, the song book of the Jews. I'm, I'm sure that some of the Psalms were on their lips at that moment. They're just singing. They're offering prayers. God, thank you. Were they thanking him because they had been beaten? No, read carefully. They went on their way rejoicing. They're, they're filled with joy. They're glad. They're delighted about something. They rejoice because they have been considered worthy to suffer shame. Can you imagine that? Been considered worthy. The words that people in the temple and from house to house and on the streets of Jerusalem, the words that Peter and Andrew and James and John and Matthew and Thaddeus and the others had spoken, all pointed to an allegiance to Jesus. How they lived their lives. Remember Jesus has said, love one another as I have loved you and by this all people will know that you're my disciples. When people looked in at the apostles, that they looked in at the church, they saw behaviors that said there's an allegiance to Jesus here. They rejoiced that their words and their actions were such that people could not help but recognize they were followers of Christ. And you'd think, then why would they beat them? Well, folks, anybody who opposes the gospel of Christ is going to oppose that kind of life. They rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer Shame. This beating, this mistreatment, the imprisonment. They were treated shamefully. They were dishonored. They were disgraced. They were degraded. Not as some kind of badge of honor. Look at me. But because again, it just, well, it was a fulfillment of things that Jesus himself had said. They rejoiced in, in suffering do you remember the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7? In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives us what we call the Beatitudes. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you, because of me. Rejoice. Be glad. For your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Because of me. Because of Jesus. Their allegiance to him. That's what they considered them. They were considered worthy of suffering shame 
for the name, for their identity, for their being Christians, for their belonging to Jesus. Peter, who heard Jesus' words there in the Sermon on the Mount, and who was one of these in the book of Acts, arrested and beaten, and who writes in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 14, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Sharing in His suffering. Sharing suffering for His name. Paul wrote to Timothy, in his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, an interesting little statement. He says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, there's a Bible promise for you. Put that one on a plaque and hang it on your kitchen wall. You want to live for Jesus? You'll be persecuted. Welcome to the club. Wow. I thought following Jesus was all Smiles and happy. Well, there were those in Acts 5 who were doing what? Rejoicing because they had been considered worthy of suffering shame for his name. Let's go back to the words of Jesus himself. It's the upper room. It's the night of Jesus' betrayal. Tomorrow he will be crucified. It's in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. For my name's sake. Because they do not know the one who sent me. There are those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are those who hate his very name. And therefore, those who follow him will face the same hatred. But here's something I think is really cool. Back in Acts chapter 5, what did the apostles do? Did they go back and cower and hide? Did they decide, we'll be Christians in secret? We won't talk about Jesus, but we'll hold him in our hearts and we'll just go on with our lives so that we don't get in any trouble. Did they say, we'll just give up this whole Jesus thing altogether anyway? Yeah, he came back from the dead, but hey, giving up our lives and taking these beatings, it just ain't worth it. Did you catch what Luke wrote? Every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then started all over again. Every day, in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. There it is again. They could not help but talk about what they'd seen and heard. They could not keep silent, even in the face of persecution. I don't know about you folks. I'm kind of a baby. I have a low pain threshold. I guess I'm one of those typical males that people laugh about. You know, Gretchen gets sick. She just keeps on charging and doing her thing. I get sick, and I'm in bed whining. The whole idea of persecution makes me uncomfortable. I love my Lord. And I would hope and I would pray that if I faced torture and torment for his name, that I would be able to be like these guys. Or like Rebecca in the video. Rebecca's village in Nigeria was attacked by 
the Islamist group Boko Haram. You've probably heard that name in the news over the last few years. Her husband, her son, did you catch it? They were killed in the attack. But she held on to the word of God because the word of God told her that what? God is the husband of the widow. And for her daughter, God is the father of the fatherless. Her hope was in Christ in spite of the loss that was immense. Man, could I be like Rebecca? I'd hope so. You know, there's a lot of things in life I'd give up in a heartbeat. I love hockey and I'm a Buffalo Sabres fan. Everybody was watching the World Series last night. I had my phone with the Sabres radio stream going so I could hear them lose to Tampa Bay. What a bummer. But if someone came to me and put a gun to my head and said, you can't be a Buffalo Sabres fan anymore or die, I'd say, fine. Who do you want me to cheer for? That's just hockey. You know? This one would be hard. If someone came to me and said, we're going to throw you in prison for the rest of your days unless you eat liver and onions. Man, that would be hard for me. You may love liver and onions, but no, don't, don't put it on my plate. Mm -mm. But if someone said, you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life, I'd try to choke that stuff down. I'm not going to fight you on that one. All right? But if someone says, give up your faith, renounce Christ, what Christians in the first century in the Roman Empire faced, and faced until Constantine's reign in the 300s, what Christians have faced for 2,000 years in various pockets around our planet, what our brothers and sisters face today in certain lands, this banner that's out here, I hope you'll take a look at it. It's just a map of the world. The nations that are black are the most oppressive nations where your faith is outlawed and where death might come your way. There's a lot of them. The nations that are in yellow are supposedly you can hold your Christian faith, but you better be careful about how you hold it. There's a lot of them. To be aware. And I guess that's what I want to share with you now. Is I, have, I have four things that I want to set before you hopefully just as practical application to this sermon. The first is this, be aware. I, I wanted to raise awareness. Gretchen could tell you that for years I marked the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church wherever I was preaching. A couple of times we've even held underground church services. You, you can't recreate persecution, but we tried to create the environment where when you sing, you're not singing out loud, you're singing very quietly. Because if the police on the street go by and hear this praise, they'll raid your home. But you're still going to praise. Where Bibles are few and far between. I have so many Bibles in my office, I could probably give all of you one and still have plenty. But what if I was in a place where owning a Bible was illegal? Or my Bible was burnt? <laughs> It's not like I can go on Amazon.com and have one in two days with free shipping. Are we aware of what so many brothers and sisters face? So I want to point you to some resources. There are a number of ministries that care for the persecuted. Voice of the Martyrs is just one of them. There's Christian Freedom International and, and quite a few others. But Voice of the Martyrs and uh, that's their website. If you're web savvy and you like doing things online, persecution.com, that's easy to remember. They've got prayer guides and they've got stories of the persecuted and they've got opportunities for you to be able to give. Uh, you can buy a box of Bibles really cheap to be sent to one of these nations where our brothers and sisters don't really have access to Bibles. Uh, you can send Christmas packs so that they can celebrate Christmas and things like that. Uh, Voice of the Martyrs does a boatload of stuff. If you like to read, and, and whether you read on a Kindle or a Nook, or whether you still like pen and paper, uh, I put five books up here. Uh, I'll give them to you because they're not that easy to see. Top left, Tortured for Christ. That's the story of Richard Wormbrand. Uh, Pastor Wormbrand ministered in a Lutheran church in Romania under the darkest days of communism. Uh, he was tortured 
horrendously, and the story is told in the book. It, it's his own autobiography. Interestingly enough, after he had gained his freedom, he comes to the United States and he testifies before the Joint Houses of Congress in D.C. And this man who had been tortured, he takes off his shirt, he stands before Congress without his shirt, and his body is just scar after scar after scar. Kind of shook him up a little bit, I guess. The second book, The Pastor's Wife, interestingly enough, is the story of Sabina Wormbrand, <laughs> Richard's wife. Uh, think, ladies, your husband has been thrown into prison. You're in a nation that is not going to support you because you're a Christian. Your faith is illegal. What's your life going to be like? <laughs> The pastor's wife is her story. I'd recommend both of those in tandem. Uh, top right, Their Blood Cries Out by Paul Marshall. It's probably the best of the five books. It just, story after story, uh, action step after action step, trying to understand the suffering of our brothers and sisters in the world. Their Blood Cries Out by, it, it draws on what? Cain and Abel. Remember God said to, to Cain what? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Bottom left, persecuted the global assault on Christians. Not just religious persecution, but specifically focused against the followers of Christ. And the bottom right, I really like this book. It's called I Am N. Uh, you may have remembered this from a few years back. This is out of the, the rise of ISIS in Iraq. And you see the little, what looks like a U with a dot? That's from the Arabic alphabet. It, it's the Arabic letter that would equate N in our language. And when ISIS rolled into the ancient city of Mosul, the, the, the Christian church in Mosul could trace its history back 2,000 years. Think about where that takes it. First century. Right on the heels of everything we read about in the Gospels and Acts. And when ISIS rode, rolled into Mosul, if your business was Christian-owned, or if you were a family, your house would be spray-painted with this little N, and it marked you for death. You better run. And Mosul was left with no Christian population. I am N. Why N? The Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. That's how they were identified by Isis, the followers of the Nazarene. And this book is stories of persecution under Isis, uh, specifically in Mosul, where people stood up and said, I am N. I am a follower of Jesus. I am a Nazarene. I am a Christian. I follow Jesus. And no threat upon my life will cause me to abandon that faith. So that's all about raise awareness. The next three will go real quick, although first service, I kind of ran a little long, didn't I? We're good. Second one, I want to stir compassion. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3 says this, Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. The author of Hebrews calls us to Christian empathy for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. When we think of those who are imprisoned because of their faith, be mindful of them, even as though you were in the next cell because of your faith. When they're ill-treated, be empathetic toward them. Be mindful of their suffering, of their pain, because you're also a part of the very same body, the body of Christ. And when one member suffers, every member suffers with it. It's just like our physical bodies. You're going to hang a picture on the wall and you've got a little finishing nail and a hammer and you miss the nail and you hit your thumb. Yeah, yeah, the thumb hurts. But guess what? That pain doesn't just stay in the thumb. It radiates down the arm. It kind of hits the body. And you go, oh, wow, that just hurts everywhere. When one part of the body suffers... Every part of the body suffers. Empathy. Let it stir compassion. I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> I have often marked the International Day of Prayer uh, for the persecuted church. I told Gretchen just yesterday, we were sitting and talking over dinner, and I said, I'm preaching this sermon tomorrow, 
that you're listening to now. And I said, where's my compassion gone? I've forgotten the persecuted church for some reason. Maybe I'm just too busy with my own issues, and believe me, i got plenty of issues. Maybe I've, I, I don't know. But I want to reignite my compassion and stir compassion in you that we might remember the prisoners as though we were right there with them in prison. And when we remember them, number three, I want to prompt action. What can we do? Well, the most important thing, remember in my introduction, before Betty and Kelly prayed for us, when these ministry organizations go into these persecuted areas, and they have to do so very carefully, and they ask the persecuted brothers and sisters, what can we do for you? Do you, do you need money? Would you like for us to lobby at the UN and change laws? Would, what, what, what can we do for you? Their number one answer is always this, please pray for us. And we here in the West, we tend to go, well, isn't there something more you want us to do? Pray for us. Because they know that their hope, their strength, their comfort, their salvation is in Christ. That to be in the hand of God is the safest place to be. So pray. You might want to finance. If you go to that persecution.com website just about everything that they have is right there and you can do it digitally but if you still like to read something hold it in your hands they have a wonderful newsletter it's actually a magazine they'll send it to you free but how about giving them enough money to cover printing and postage <laughs> so that more of their money can go to ministering to our suffering brothers and sisters like I said, you can buy a box of Bibles really cheap. Gretchen and I do that every once in a while. Just so that they can have the Word of God in their hands, even if it is a copy that's burnt. <laughs> like Rebecca in the video. This might be interesting. Some organizations, and I believe Voice of the Martyrs does too, has a pen pal program. And I love how this works. They might have a names of, of a dozen pastors in Vietnam who are in prison because, well, they're pastors. <laughs> and they will put you in touch. You write your letter. It goes to Voice of the Martyrs. They translate it into Vietnamese, and they get it into the hands of those prisoners so that you can offer them encouragement from central Illinois. And catch this, though. Those letters will be read by the jailers. So put a boatload of scripture in there. You preach the gospel in this letter so the jailers are reading the message of Jesus and then they give this letter to the prisoner and they're reading that someone in Creve Corps, Illinois actually cares about me in Phnom Penh. You can do that. It doesn't cost anything but a stamp and a little bit of time. Last thing, number four. I simply put in my notes this way, be prepared. I am not a prophet. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know what this afternoon's going to bring. I don't know what we're having for dinner because Gretchen's not told me. Okay, I, I don't see tomorrow. I do know that Jesus said that when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will violent persecution come to our shores? Will violent persecution come to our shores in our lifetime? Yeah, I don't know. We definitely do not face the harsh realities that our brothers and sisters do in Iran, North Korea, North Africa, and other places. But there has been a slow erosion of some of our freedoms. Let's just be honest. But we don't suffer like many do. But here's my challenge. 
If persecution were to come tomorrow, how will you respond? Will you throw up your hands and surrender and say, okay, who do you want me to worship? Or will you say along with the apostles, we can't help but talk about what we've seen and heard. Would you go out from a beating, rejoicing, singing, offering prayers of praise to God because you were considered worthy of suffering shame for the name? It's interesting, in the original language, what Luke wrote there, it doesn't say his name, it just says the name. Because when those early Christians read that from Luke, they didn't have to wonder, who's he talking about? No, the name. The name of Jesus. You see, I conclude this series on Pollyanna, finding the good in the midst of hardship, with this message on the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Because when everything seems upside down and everything seems wrong, and even our very faith is being assailed by the denizens of hell itself, we're in God's hands. We're in God's hands. And there is no better place to be. Would you stand as we sing? All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence seated and Ryan before you speak I forgot something from <laughs> in my message I have a whole box of resources from Voice of the Martyrs usually I go out there I'm going to stay up here because the box is up here there are prayer guides this walks you through the most hostile nations on earth what's going on there and how to pray for the church there I have about 25 of those this is just a little reminder to pray there's a perforated tear out bookmark if you still use books with paper to them there's a bookmark here and an invitation to sign up for um, their prayer ministry thing and then I have 10 DVDs of the Rebecca story okay here's what I told people and I'm on, I'm being honest share this with your family on Thanksgiving when you set to give thanks this might jar some thanksgiving around the table. I have 10 of those. It's all free. If you're interested, I will be sitting up here after the service. All right. Well, good morning. November is, well, first off, the first Sunday not only is International Day of Prayer, but November is the, the month of thanksgiving, to be thankful so I want you to consider and think about everything that you have to be thankful for. 
You know, so th those lists can vary from massive to just small, but there's something everyone can be thankful for, especially living in the United States. I personally, I'm thankful for each and every one of you here. You know, the, the time that we get to spend together to worship our God freely is a reason to be thankful. I'm extremely thankful for God's mercy, his grace, and his love. I'm so also very grateful for God's miracles that he still performs each and every day. Um, many of you know that I've been going and visiting uh, a close friend of mine, Richard. And uh, let me tell you, this man is a miracle. About three months ago, he was in stage five kidney failure. This week, they removed the dialysis ports. His kidneys are fully functioning. Talk about a miracle. I love you, Richard. He watches us. So God still performs those miracles. I need people to be understanding the thankfulness that is given to God. Um, we'll get our communion prepared here in just a little bit. So that way you're not just sitting there holding them individually, waiting and thinking, well, he's going to do it now. <laughs> Wrong. No. <laughs> And if I'm a little slow, don't think anything of it. My day began at 2.30 a.m. this morning. I was at work by, seven, or by 3. I was home at 7 to take a shower to be here at 8.30. So I'm, I am grateful and thankful that I'm here. So, but anyways, communion today is from the Christian standard. Uh, it's this month's, and it talks about communion, the Lord's Supper, is the crown jewel of our worship. It's a time that we should be focusing and centralizing our Christian walk with Christ. This is a huge, massive part of our worship. So the highest form of corporate Christian worship is the Lord's Supper. The celebration, the supper directs our attention. This is the one time you'll hear me say this, backwards. Normally, I said, we can't, we can't live life in the rearview mirror. We need to look backwards to the cross. We need to look backwards to Christ in order to move forward to Christ's return. So this is the one time you'll hear me say that. So let's look backwards and let's get encouraged to go forward to the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> in addition, this provides us a time to examine our own personal relationship with God as well as the relationship with our fellow believers the persecuted believers, the followers around the world, this is what we're supposed to be preparing ourselves for to experience because we are all one body. The observance is so simple a child can partake with a sense they can understand, yet it contains so many theological ramifications that even the most mature believer will not fully comprehend its meaning. Yeah, so... We can, we can dwell on it, we can compassion, we can't, but we can't grasp, we, we truly can't, can't grasp the love of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 25, For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup of the new covenant is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, Jesus says, do this. And he's talking about remembering him, remembering his sacrifice, remembering his love. Because so many times we can just fall into the, the, the motions, okay, we're going to commune. But if we don't remember why we commune, we are doing Jesus a great injustice because he died for each one of us. So Jesus wants us to remember him. He wants us to remember his great love, his tremendous sacrifice. So if our minds are a million miles away from what's happening right here, right now, we've lost the focus. 
we need to make sure that we're uplifting Christ, that we're remembering him. You know, so we need to make sure that we take the time to remember that Christ died for our sins. You know, he set us free from sin, death, and hell. Hell. No one else can do that. So I'd ask that you go ahead and prepare your emblems. And I want you to think about this, and then I'm going to pray for us, and then we will partake together. Jesus is always with us. He said he would never leave us. But have we left him alone at this table? Or are you accepting the invitation to remember him? I want to give you just a moment to examine yourself before you partake. Then I will pray and we'll partake together. So. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we, we come to you at this time, Father, with thanksgiving in our hearts. Father, we thank you that you are such an awesome God that you still perform miracles today. Father, we thank you that you invite us to this table to partake of this meal together. Father, to remember what Jesus has done for us. Father, we can't thank you enough for that love. We can't fully understand it, but we are so grateful for it. Father, as we prepare to partake, we ask that we remember Christ's body that was beaten for us. We ask that we remember his blood that was shed for us. Father, we can't thank you enough for the love that you have for us, that you would send your son to take away our sins, to prevent us from our destiny of hell to have the opportunity to serve and live with you in heaven. Father, we thank you so much for all your blessings, but most of all for sending your son. And it's in Jesus' most precious and loving name that we pray. Amen.